Hi, good afternoon. My name is Stefan von der Flaert, and I'm a conscious entrepreneur. Ever since a young age, I've been fascinated with technology and startups. The reason for this is the fact that I grew up in a tech-obsessed family. Now, I'm Dutch, but I spent most of my life growing up between Silicon Valley, Stuttgart, and Bergen, a small town in the Netherlands. The reason I love technology so much is because through it, you have the ability to touch, influence, and change people's lives. Today, I'm here to share my passion for entrepreneurship, in particular, conscious entrepreneurship. So what do I mean when I say conscious entrepreneurship? As Lisa Princhett says, conscious entrepreneurship is about doing business with your values intact. It is a mentality by which entrepreneurs reach their desired goals. Making money, doing this in a sustainable way, and achieving social good do not necessarily have to be in opposition to one another. Conscious entrepreneurs maximize value for all stakeholders in a project. Be this the customers, the team members, the suppliers, the investors or funders, and the community and environment alike. Through viewing their business holistically, and as part of a larger ecosystem, that of conscious capitalism, Conscious entrepreneurs can gain a competitive edge over traditional entrepreneurs. Now, whilst not-for-profits, charities, and other social projects are no doubt important, conscious entrepreneurs opt to improve the world through their business or startup. This is key. To be a conscious entrepreneur does not necessarily mean that you're not interested in profits or money. You are. Simply think of it as money with a mission. So conscious entrepreneurship is based on four notions. One, the business has a deeper purpose beyond maximizing profits and shareholder value. This being a more 20th century perception to what a successful business is like, where this was the key metric of success. Two, the business is managed in such a way that it optimizes value for all stakeholders in a project. Three, the leader of the business manages with a holistic view that goes beyond the traditional mechanical perception of a business. It is up to the leader, him or herself, to bring soul and vision to the company. And four, the business has a tangible, conscious culture. Examples of this are trust, authenticity, ownership, belonging, etc. So examples of conscious entrepreneurs and their businesses in today's world can be seen with both Whole Foods and Buffer, both demonstrating conscious entrepreneurship on various scales. Now, John Mackey, the CEO and co-founder of Whole Foods, is also one of the pioneers behind the thought process of conscious entrepreneurs. He says this, a business is best not thought of as a machine with various factors of production working in tandem to maximize profits. A business is not a machine. Just as an entrepreneur cannot be replaced with a computer. A conscious business embodies the soul vision, and aspirations of the entrepreneur him or herself. Now, although it may sound counterintuitive, the best way to maximize profits over the long term is to not make pro profits the primary goal of the business. At Whole Foods, their CEO's salary is a function of average employee pay. Employees enjoy benefits, such as health savings plans, and report higher levels of happiness in the workplace. Conscious businesses build value across constituencies by reinvesting in their communities, by being philanthropic and supporting other social projects. In 2006, Whole Foods became the largest corporate purchaser of wind energy credits in the US, covering 100% of their building energy needs. They also refused to stock any products harvested from endangered species and habitats and have even gone so far as to create an animal compassion standard for other businesses to use to evaluate their supply chains. From all of their activities beyond their day-to-day -day business operations, Whole Foods still manages to be a very profitable business. So shifting our focus to conscious entrepreneurship on a smaller scale, let's explore Buffer. Specifically in the case of Buffer, their CEO, Joel Gascon, has done a phenomenal job in creating an open culture within. They publish everything, from wages to equity to their recent investment round. What this then does internally is create a huge sense of ownership and belonging. Knowledge is power. Knowing what goes in within your company gives you a sense of trust. 
Now, of course, we cannot expect entrepreneurs and their businesses to solve all problems under the sun. Therefore, it's up to the entrepreneur, him or herself, to set the expectation and responsibilities for his or her own venture. Now, entrepreneurs and their startups are not the only organizations where conscious capitalism can be adhered to. Larger corporations have started to warm up to the notion that they need to be responsible for more than just maximizing shareholder value and profits. Post-Second World War, the focus was on rebuilding. There was no real regard for this how it done. Therefore, it became a quick and dirty process. However, now in the 21st century, the focus is being steered towards sustainable growth. I believe that the consumer's mindset is slowly shifting towards one where we take into account a company's do-good actions. We are collectively becoming more conscious of their actions and are embedding this into our purchasing decision. Whether a company is social by nature will become a vital part of their brand. It will be a differentiator, like screen size, number of stitches in a jacket, etc. The best part is, we as the consumer have the power to steer this conversation and mindset. We just need to learn how to correctly yield it. Since we're in a free market, there are enough entrepreneurs out there capable of spotting opportunities where others are not doing it right. We need to support this initiative and the process of founding of new businesses in which the do-good attitude is upheld. If companies, current companies, are too slow or not bothered to adopt. Just imagine, what if Walmart, a company employing 1% of the US working population, were to increase its wages? At the end, business is pretty simple. Business is all about relationships. Successful business is about reciprocal relationships. We as the consumer have the power not to reciprocate and force change. A company's ability to succeed depends on their ability to change. So examples of conscious capitalism in today's world and past world can be seen with Henry Ford. In 1914, when Henry Ford doubled his employees' wages, he was playing a deeper, longer game. When his first car, the Model N, reached mass production, it cost around $3,000, therefore making it accessible only to that era's 1%. Now, Ford quickly realized the automobile would do better on a volume rather than niche model. Therefore, he proclaimed he would build the automobile for the greater magnitudes. After countless innovation, Ford managed to reduce the cost of the Model T down to $500. However, per capita income at the time was only $354. Ford's theory. Employees should be able to consume the products they help produce. Rewording this, employers are responsible for driving consumption. By the end of 1921, Ford had half the US car market. Examples of conscious businesses today can be seen with Intel and Apple. Intel with driving conflict-free materials in their supply chain, and Apple with moving production back into the US with its Mac Pro line. Yes, it takes longer for corporations to embed conscious capitalism into their day-to-day -day business operations. Even longer for them to change their culture versus the time taken for a startup to do so. However, it should be considered nonetheless. Why? Because not only does it make good business sense, we as consumers are starting to demand that the businesses with whom we do business with start operating on a more conscious platform. So how can universities help in creating and molding conscious leaders and entrepreneurs? So universities are in the beneficial position of being part of someone's life in which he or she is essentially trying to define him or herself. Sure, by the time you've left your parents' home, you shouldn't have learned a thing or two, such as being able to distinguish right from wrong, having developed some form of moral compass, learned stuff about the world. However, at university, you're surrounded by thousands of people from all over the globe with different mindsets, ways of doing things, etc. And all of this aggregates in one spot. A salad bowl of young minds open to inspiration and looking to define their path in life. Universities can support the development of socially integrated leaders by encouraging, enabling, and supporting their students to get involved with entrepreneurial projects beyond their degrees 
by working together with charities in the areas and getting their students plugged into activities, working together with companies or corporations who set certain problem sets for their students to solve in real world examples and scenarios, and even going so far as to encouraging their students to found companies whilst at universities and giving them the time off if need be to pursue it. Now I have seen this done well at the University of Huddersfield where the directive comes straight from the vice chancellor. In other universities, Warwick and UCL, for example, this is a more student-less initiative through societies such as Warwick Entrepreneurs, Warwick Volunteering, UCL Enterprise Society, and UCL's own department, UCL Advances. In Cambridge, organizations such as Beyond Profit, Cambridge Hub, and Judge Business School's recently opened Center for Social Innovation encourage their students to get involved with activities in their area as well as giving them a platform in order to think through things and realize them in the real world. So universities can differentiate themselves by the seriousness in which they view their influence in helping create leaders, especially socially integrated ones. If they can do this, they have a unique selling point for both employers as well as prospective students, as they will no doubt take this under consideration when deciding where to spend the next X years of their lives. Now, of course, we must come to terms with ourselves and say that universities cannot be expected to set our entire future up for us, as this is simply impossible. They can, however, expose you to different areas, arts, charities, startups, corporations, in which you might pick one, fall in love with, and run with after university. So what am I doing, and what is this have to do with conscious entrepreneurship. So something I fundamentally believe is that startups have the ability to drive true social and economic change through the innovative products and services they create, as well as the jobs that they form. Now, Alex Dobinson and I co-founded a startup called Nucleus, which aims to help entrepreneurs realize their ideas. We do this by matching their ideas with the people needed to realize it. What we aim to achieve through Nucleus is quite simple. To create micro Silicon Valleys everywhere. Bringing entrepreneurship to the masses. Entrepreneurial ecosystems in which the do good and can do attitude is upheld. You see, it's in helping entrepreneurs realize their ideas and see those ideas turn into startups that gets me out of bed every single day. So many entrepreneurs I come across in my day to day life are conscious about how they do business. Their motivations are not financial, rather change-driven. If you were to ask any of the startups in our Accelerate Cambridge cohort this year, not one would put money as their primary motive. Entrepreneurs and their startups have an amazing opportunity to show larger corporations the benefits of conscious capitalism. Startups are by nature smaller, therefore it's easier to implement change in one. If entrepreneurs lead by example, create a bottoms-up approach, we can bring conscious capitalism to the larger companies. My call to action is this. If you're an entrepreneur, challenge yourself in thinking how you can embed conscious capitalism into your startup. If you're an employee of an organization, identify an activity which you can influence and integrate conscious thinking into it, into both the design as well as process of that activity. And finally, all of us as consumers can show our support on a daily basis for conscious businesses through the purchases we make and the relationships we build. Do not be deterred by the time taken in order to see change. Like all good things in life, the benefits of your actions will show with time. Thank you. <laughs>